we thank you for the day we have and opportunity we have to gather with you and just to look to you and to study and to see the insight into you, into your word. We ask you to take away the sins of our hearts, minds, souls. Give us a clear thought and mind and spirit. Cleanse us. We confess our sin before you. We know you are faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness. And, and Father, we thank you for just being our faithful Father, our loving, our loving Master, and continuing to help us to be better children and stewards for you and of the truth you give to us. Continue to help us to lean, learn and lean on you from these lessons you give to us through the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding how you appeared to men before time and for the purposes and reasons we will continue to see and look and be uh, influenced by your, your word and how you want us to grab the best, to, to hold on to your truth, to have to shed light in our hearts how we should live better and look toward your coming as our soon and coming bridegroom. So we thank you for all you have done, continue to do, and will do in our lives. We ask you to dedicate this time um, in our hearts, minds, spirits, be loving you as we should, and as you say, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We, Father, we ask you to be our counselor, our guide, our director, our teacher, our counselor, our pastor in this time. So teach us, grow us, and guide us, and edify us, and correct us. We pray all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, so who's on, just Laney's online right now? Yes. Okay, well, they're late, so we're just going to start. So... Today's lesson is on the conclusion of the Theophanies and Christophanies. And we left off um, with the New Testament part of it in regards to how the Lord appeared to uh, Joseph. And we saw with Joseph that there's the phrasing in the Greek language that references how when he says, Behold, or lo, behold, that that was a reference to how the Greek suffix ends the word, that it is a demarcation of how that is referencing the Lord himself talking to Joseph because it's the phrasing, the angel of the Lord. Therefore, the spirit of Christ came to proclaim himself to Joseph that I am that who is in the womb of Mary, your betrothed. That's pretty profound to me. And he does it not just once in, in Matthew chapter 1, but he does it again in verse uh, chapter 2 regarding to leave Egypt. So two times he appears to Joseph which two's number of witness and testimony to bear witness and testify to, to, to Joseph of uh, who he is and who his role will be. And Joseph's, that is, as the one who would raise him up. What a, what a privilege Joseph had to be the earthly uh, parent. Uh, I want to say earthly father. It's earthly parent for, for Jesus. You know, it's really amazing. So to, to raise him up to Yeshua. So then what we have also in and the um, reality of, we looked at, then Luke, we didn't look at Luke yet, but I'm going to look at Luke and show you that. And Luke, the difference is, is, is from Matthew. In Matthew, we have the angel of the Lord and referencing again the lo and behold, ending with the ooh, um, the O-U. So I, I do. So it speaks to the suffix again, mentioning the, that the should be a the there. So it's not in the English translated correctly, nor is it transliterated correctly underneath the Greek word. But when you read the grammar on page 10 of the Emphatic Diglot, which gives you the insight into the Greek word, the grammar should be, and in, in the word itself, a prefix or a suffix can change the demeanor of a word and, and it can express one, two, or three different words that we have to use in English to just, they do that in the one word in Greek. So again, Greek structure of prefixes and suffixes could express three different words that we take those words in English to express. They do it in one word because of their ability and the grammar to do so. All right. So with that being said, that's how we figured that out from Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, 24, and Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 19. So let me go over to Luke. And if you look over into Luke in chapter uh, 2, verse, um, not Luke, Luke 2, Luke 1, excuse me. In Luke chapter 1, verse 11 to 19, when the angel appears to Zechariah, this is not the same referencing. You don't see a the angel or the angelos of the Lord. But in verse 11, and you, it says, and, the, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. This is the Zechariah projecting the, proclaiming the birth of John the Baptist, the precursor, the forerunner of, of the prayer of the way for Jesus, Yeshua. So on, if you look at the um, context here, where it says on the left side of your margin of Luke 1.11, appeared of appeared and to him a messenger an angelos of the lord so of the lord uh, of a lord means of the lord because it's meant in kyrios or kyriou so the you means of the 
So it's the, it should be translated, um, there appeared to him, as it is in, on the right side, it's correct here in the English, an angel of the Lord. That is correct. But it's not the angel of the Lord. So the proper article, the, which emphasizes in Greek, I want to make sure we emphasize that, no pun intended, that in English, the word a and the and articles, they particularize, we'd use that in their English grammar, but in the Greek, Koine Greek grammar, they emphasize. And as such, it goes back to John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. It does say that, but in a, it's an emphatic emphasis of the only God there ever was, it is him. So there's a reference here to the, uh, meaning, again, the Lord, meaning the only Lord there is, but there's no the in front of the word angel, which means it's not the representation of the Spirit of Christ in the angelic form as we look at that phrasing, the angel of the Lord, whenever that's used, it's denoting the angelic form of the Spirit of Christ. In this case, in Luke 111, we do not see the word the, the emphatic article, before the messenger or the angelos word. So, in this case, the angel appearing to Zechariah, also in verse 13, but it says the angel said to him, so in verse 13 you have here, it says the angel, that is true. So many would say, well, if it says the angel here said to him, but earlier it doesn't say the angel of the Lord, you could maybe infer that it's the angel of the Lord, but it's not clearly seen. I don't believe it is. I will give latitude for those who might say, well, look, in verse 11 it says, an angel of the Lord, clearly in the text of the Greek, expressed correctly in the English on the right side. However, in verse 13, it's also correct when it says the angel. So many would say, well, why doesn't it just say, you know, uh, an angel? Because he's referencing the angel just spoke to him. That's why it's saying that angel. So I would emphasize the reason why the is here is emphasizing the angel talking to him, not a different one, but the same one. And that's why the word the is there. Some would argue, no, it would refer to, if those are wanting to support, this is the angel of the Lord, you would say, well, it's now using a abbreviated version of the angel of the Lord title, just saying the angel. I don't think that's true. I don't agree with that. But again, it's latitude for you to believe that. I just don't believe that's the case here. There's not enough evidence to show me that this is, in fact, of the Lord talking uh, to him in the spirit of Christ. This is the, an angel of the Lord talking to him on behalf of God. So you look also down to verse 18, referencing again, um, where he says, verse 18, and he says, and this is still Luke chapter 1, and, and said Zechariah to the angel, says it again, uh, ton angelos, ton angelon. So you see it again there. Um, where it's, again, the angel, but again, not of the, of the Lord, just as the angel. And so if you continue on uh, in the next, the next verse, and it says again, the angel said to him, um, then he even tells you who the angel is, I am that Gabriel. Yes? Maybe said repeat how the differentiation is made between Greek and English. English particularizes. English particularizes, or English particularizes, and you say, I want a glass of water, I want uh, the, the shirt off the rack, you know, that kind of thing. We particularize, we're, we're particularly talking about that subject that follows the article. So if I want a glass, I'm particularizing, I want, you know, a glass of water, I want. But when, and when you're doing it in Greek, it emphasizes. So in, in English, an article particularizes, in Greek, it emphasizes. So there's a big difference. So if you had a bunch of plastic cups in your house and you had one, the basic example I can give you, if you had a, plastic, a, a couple of plastic cups, tall Tupperware in your house, for example, but you had one glass cup in your house, and you said to me, Preston, do you want some water? And I said, I want a glass of water. Now, in English, that could just mean it doesn't really emphasize the glass per se. It's just saying, I want a glass of water. I want water and a, and a cup. It's an English rendering, I say. I, I mean glass is in a euphemism of saying, I want a pop. I want a soda. I'm not saying Pepsi, Coke, Dr. Pepper. I'm just saying a pop. So it's the same journal as it. But here in the, in the Greek, when I say, if I say I want a glass, what I'm saying in Greek is, you said to me, do you want something to drink? And I say, I want a glass. I'm saying, the only glass you had that you and I both know is in your house, I want that glass, that glass with water. I want the glass, not the Tupperware. I want the glass of water. So I'm emphasizing, and you're going, okay, relax. So I'm like, I just don't like plastic. And all of a sudden, you, you know by me saying a glass, 
there's an emotional emphatic, niche, emphatic nature to that. Even though in English, you don't pick up on that when you read it. You're just saying, he said he wanted a glass. No, 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 no. If you could hear him say it, he'd be saying, a glass. Or he'd be saying, the glass. You know, he'd be more emphatic about it. So there's a tone that is, that is imputed when an article is used in Koine Greek. The tone is raised, most definitely. Whenever there's an article in Greek, in Koine Greek, it is, the, the tone is raised. So the content, remember, the content and the tone represents right about 45% of communication. The other 55% is in body language. Well, body language, when you're being emphatic and your tone is raised, is guess what? Animated. More so than usual, isn't it? You're not placid. You're not melancholy in your delivery. You're very much animated. More so than you would have been if you were not emphatic, right? So I would therefore emphasize to you that every time you see an article used, by the Lord using a writer in the scripture, that writer, that, that, that writer who's writing from the author God himself who's telling them what to write, their body language is being more animated. Their tone is being raised because they're being emphatic. And that's why in John, in Revelation, when he says, I want to take those who are with Jezebel and throw them in the bed, the bed, as we know in Job, is Hades. And so he's emphasizing the body language is more animated. The tone is raised because he's emphatic. Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah. Answered your question, Lainey? She said thanks. You got it. So in Luke 1, I was just taking to the journey of where it says the angel and those who would say, well, the angel is a reference to the angel of the Lord. That I would say, nope. Here's an evidence where, because going back to the first mentioning in verse 11 of Luke 1, it's an angel, not the. And then he ends the, the coupling of these verses to prove to you that it's the angel Gabriel. He says so in verse 19. And he says that titling before he says that, he says, and the angel answering said to him, I am that Gabriel. Well, therefore, that concludes you cannot use the phrase the angel by itself to specify that that's Christ or the spirit of Christ or the angel of the Lord because the Gabriel just gave that title unto himself and that's not the same thing because he's just saying I'm that angel that's talking to you. He's emphasizing the one in the moment and the context. He's the angel, meaning the one who's speaking, the one who's in view, the one who's in context. Yes? Lady had said yes to your answer to her question. Yeah. And Pat said, so where on the left in the Greek oh, will I find the word am? And then Tracy said, so the Greek uses grammar instead of punctuation for the emphasis. Yeah, great, great. It's a, that's an awesome statement. That's correct. I, I never thought about that statement, but you're right. Greek uses grammar and punctuation, actually, because you'll see punctuation also. Um, and, and the transliteration, but you're correct. In the, in the Koine Greek itself, you're correct. It doesn't use punctuation. It uses the grammar to express punctuation. We use punctuate, punctuation, which is why sometimes in the, in the, Hebrew, in the um, English rendering, you'll see an explanation point because they're trying to emphasize to you and me the, the grammatical text of that word. That's if you ever wondered why the word's capitalized or why it's punctuated. We use capital letters and we use punctuation. So we use upper and lower case and punctuation to emphasize, and the Greek uses to the grammar itself. It doesn't need those handicaps. It's just, and the word itself can go, I, I can do better than that. I can express my, how I feel, my punctuation. I can express my emphatic nature. I can express the position of the, the, the verb tense all within the one word. And, and English is going, whoa, excuse me. Well, Koine Greek is that much more superior to English, no doubt. So. You wouldn't find Greek people, Koine Greek folks who, the language, you wouldn't have them call a parkway a driveway and a driveway a parkway, which is kind of crazy, right? Because on a driveway you park, and on a parkway you drive. It's kind of funny. Only in English can you have that kind of thing, right? Or say T-O-M-B, tomb, but C-O-M-B, cum? No, comb. See, only in English do we have ignorance like, like that. It doesn't make any sense to me, you know what I mean? But that's how we do things in English. Little, Greek makes a lot of sense. It's just hard to, to, to follow it when you're not used to reading it. And speaking it obviously, but on the left side of your margin, to Pam's point, there is no. Uh, when you look at there is no the. So in, in verse eleven, um, it's and you see in verse eleven appeared to him, angel, angelos. There's no uh, there's no the there. So it's just it means an a angel or an, an angel. Um, there's no emphasis uh, to look to. If you're looking for the word a or an, there isn't one there. It's just because it, when there's nothing, no article in front of it or just it may have sometimes an an in front of it it just it just uh, is, is a there you, you see in verse 13 it's just not there because it doesn't emphasize whereas in verse 13 
it does say O or the, because um, that comes from him to the messenger, angelos. So there is the article there. But again, it doesn't emphasize that he's the angel of the Lord. It just references he's the angel that spoke earlier in verse 11. So the emphasis there is on the angel itself who's speaking earlier. Um, same angel, not a different one. So therefore, you go on in verse 18 and to the same thing where he says again, um, the or the tone, uh, angelon. So there's a the there again. So, so on the left side, you wouldn't see an A per se. Uh, you would just see it by itself, the word itself, ending in a singularity. So if the, if the suffix at the end of the word is a singular tense, then you're going to see it oftentimes just by itself. Um, but if it's got a, a suffix at the end that it changes, then that's how you would know there's a the involved. In this case, there's not. The angelos is just the singular tense of the word. So it's just a matter of that's the word itself. So there's nothing to look for before it. Except for when it's there, then you have to, s to figure out, like in this case, is the the there to emphasize the angel? Or is there a titling of the angel of the Lord? In this case, there is no titling of that. We don't find that one time in Luke chapter 1. But it shows the consistency to Brother Todd's point earlier. And last week when we said, wait, wait, wait. In the Old Testament, we said the had to be there to emphasize the angel. And yet we said in Matthew's account when he talked to Joseph, Joseph, there was that the. Remember the behold, the I do was there. It was hidden and veiled, but it's there in the Koine Greek. Not here in Luke chapter 1. Just the opposite. Gabriel even says to you, it's I. It is he. So that tells you there. So then if you go on to the book of Acts, let's look at the book of Acts, how, how the Lord appears there and, and this mentioning of the angel. So I want to look, and I've crossed off on the board a couple of uh, things. I'm going to cross off to you a couple of things here. But in Acts 5, 9, so this... Whoops. I shouldn't do it like this. Sorry. Um, how do I do this? That's just an angel. Not the angel. Okay? All right. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 19, here's the first mentioning. And if you look here, and it says, But an angel of the Lord... Acts chapter 5, verse 19, left side of your margin, to Sister Pam's point. Again, there's no A in front, but in the actual English, it does render an A there. because That's what's implied by the singularity. It's just an angel, um, uh, angelos, messenger, but of, of the Lord. But of the Lord is supposed to be there, which is translated correctly on the right, because the word curious is in the, um, curiou, excuse me, is in the, is in the of the text of the grammar and from page 10, the O-U, the U. So it does mean a messenger of the Lord. But again, it's not the angel of the Lord. So again, we know this angel, just like the one in Zechariah, is not, in this case, named. But many would say, well, is it Gabriel? Is it Michael? Is it the angel of the Lord? The answer is we don't know what angel it is. We do know for certain it's not the angel of the Lord. It's not the Spirit of Christ. Because if it is, it's consistent with the article the. This is not the case here. So I'm going to cross this off and say that's not, that doesn't apply. Right? It doesn't apply. Then you go to on Acts 7.30. And Acts 7.30, interesting that Steve, Steve what's Wendy that? has a question. Yes. She said, why if Zechariah was a prophet of the Lord, did he need an angel to come speak to him? Is it because in the New Testament, God doesn't speak through prophets any longer? So you're asking, you're asking, why did Zechariah, being a prophet of the Lord, need to have an angel speak to him? Is that what the question was, babe? Right, right. Okay. So the the difference is, I won't. I'm not focused so much on that, uh, because we do have um, uh, Anna, the Anna prophes prophesied, if you will, she about the salvation, and so did so did um, Simeon when Jesus came to the temple. So I wouldn't say there was no prophets being used at that time. They're not in the same text as what we know in the Old Testament. The Old New Testament's a, trick, trick, a tricky process of a, there's an intermission there, if you will, uh, between how God used to talk and how God began to talk in the person of Christ, right? So when he was born, it was still 33 years later, or 30 years later, excuse me, before God started speaking as the word, living word of God through and in the person of Yahshua. So for those 30 years, you still had some things happening there where there was some transition period. So you had John the Baptist, who was a, known as a prophet, remember? You had Simeon, Anna, 
Those are all true re relegated li literal prophets, as you would say. They just don't think of them as that, but they are because they did tell forth the truth and they had been inspired by God to say what they said and it was noted as such in the scripture. So I don't think it's because God didn't use prophets, it's because of the fact of the nature of the message. The nature of the message was so important that you're talking about the biggest earmark at this point in, in God's timeline is him coming into time and space and breaking through his creation and living in time as the little fetus inside of Mary. And so he wanted to therefore emphasize the prepare of the way was going to be the precursor to that. And so because of the emphasis of the message, that's why the angel spoke to Zechariah, to specify the, the, the importance, the uniqueness of this message, of this particular uh, doing of God unto his wife Elizabeth and how he was thinking, well, we're of old age. Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Haven't you read that story before, Zechariah, with Abram and Sarai? Where, where's your mind been? How could you not know that? You know? So if he's supposed to be, by the way, he's a priest. He knows the book. He knows the law, right? So that's my answer to your question. I don't think it's a matter of there was no prophets God used. It was more so the reason because of the emphasis of the uniqueness of this important message, of this important message. And she said thanks. Yeah, good question, though. Fair question. Remember also in the book of Acts, if you recall, there was also, it said, there was many prophesying. Remember when Paul came to uh, Caesarea? There was also the man, I forget his name right now, um, who also prophesied to Paul about a famine. So there are those mentionings in the book of Acts as well. So it isn't like God didn't, there was a transition period between when Jesus started speaking, then of course when he died and rose from the dead, the dead there was another gap when the apostles would teach. And before the canonization was done, there was some more issues of that being mentioned as well. So we go back to uh, Acts chapter 7, and now we're seeing how Stephen, now Stephen does an interesting thing. Stephen is not refer referencing the angel of the Lord per se, but he is, he's not, stating a, he's not stating an event that's happening at present time. He's looking back. So when he does this in verse 30, and he says, in the 40 years, in 40 years, uh, Acts 7, verse 30, 40 years being completed, there appeared to him in the desert, meaning of Moses, of, of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord, and a flame of fire in a bush. Now, Interesting, he doesn't use the phrase, the angel of the Lord. He uses the phrase, an angel of the Lord. Whereas in the Old Testament, it's clearly the angel of the Lord. It says that clearly to us in the Old Testament. So, and he also tells us who that is. So if you look further on what Stephen says, when he says in verse 32, he even recalls what the Exodus passage in chapter 3 says, I am the God of, the fa of thy fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses, being afraid, dare not look at him. So if you think about what this is, why would Stephen, in Acts 7.30, then also in verse 35 he says the same thing, similar, and he says, This is the Moses whom they renounced, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge, even him, God, sent to be a ruler and redeemer, with the hand of that angel which appeared to him in the bush. With the hand, and then again, it doesn't have the, the angel of the Lord there. So why is, why is again, Stephen emphasizing an angel of the Lord and not saying the angel of the Lord? This is the one piece in the New Testament. It's interesting because we know it's the angel of the Lord, but yet the man of God that he's using to speak about it is not referencing it as such. Why is that? And this, this supports not the fact that it debunks what we already know, what it does support is the fact that it's the angelic form of the Spirit of Christ and therefore the form of God in an angelic form as God the Son is what he's emphasizing. So I would, I would, I would say that Stephen's emphasizing the appearance of God unto Moses, not so much the person of God. Okay? So the appearance of God in that Spirit of Christ, which is an angelic form, is what he's emphasizing, not so much the actual person of that angel of the Lord referencing that titling means. So you might say, why would Stephen do that? Because Stephen is talking to the Jewish people to remind them, because again, they don't realize who that is, now do they? They do not. They don't know who Yeshua is, remember? They're denying him as the Messiah. So he's not stating, he's putting out there that the appearance of God and the, and the bush was an angelic form unto Moses, and yet we know that was God. He's I believe, building a case to the Jewish people to say, it's not our first rodeo, guys. 
we've seen the Lord appear before in a different fashion than what we didn't understand, didn't we? You know, through our great revered prophet Moses, we heard about how he was appeared to by God in an angelic form in a bush on fire. Did we not? So why is it a far stretch for you that God appeared to you as a man? You know, because we know that too from Abram's story. He talks about that too. So I think he is, re he is basically calling to mind the Jews the appearances, plural, of God unto them as an ancestral people. And yet that's why he emphasizes the angelic form that God appeared to unto Moses and not the person of the Spirit of Christ that God appeared to unto Moses in the burning bush. So that's my explanation to that as to why that is that way, because it is kind of confusing as to why he would not say that. So then you have also in verse 38, he says it again, one more time to mention, this is he who was in the congregation and the desert with that angel, again, he says it again, um, and with that angel, uh, with the angel, there he is, it says the angel, but we know that the angel does not necessarily mean the angel of the Lord, but in this context, I would say it does because he, there's no other mentioning of an angel. He referenced earlier who the angel was in the Exodus passage. He's recalling from who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with whom our fathers received living oracles to give us. So again, Stephen mentions that, but again, this is not, this is not, this is more of a reference looking back, but it's not a reference to the Spirit of God appearing. I'm crossing him off to let you know it's not a Spirit of God appearing. Um, the Spirit of Christ, I should say, appearing unto uh, Stephen. At this. He's recalling what happened before. Okay, These are mentionings of where the phrasing is used. And then Acts 8, 26. Let's look there. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And then he says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. And this is angelos. There's no the in front. So angelos of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go to towards the south, by that road leading down, from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is a desert. So again, we have him speaking to Philip, but it's not the angel of the Lord. It's just an angel. So that is also not a reference to, right, the angel of the Lord, as we know, the Spirit of Christ. So, so far, let's take inventory. Where did the phrasing, the angel of the Lord, appear in the New Testament so far? Only to Joseph. That's all we got so far. Before the birth of Christ, and then after the birth of Christ, to go to Egypt. Before, they don't divorce Mary, and then after, to go to Egypt. All right? So, there you go. And now we go to Acts chapter 10. Interesting comment here in Acts chapter 10. I'm going to forewarn you. This is actually another appearance. What we're going to find is that the, the angel of the Lord, or the Spirit of Christ, appeared to Joseph, Cornelius, Peter, and Paul. Now, we know with Paul, we already know that in chapter 9. We don't have to look at that. There's no reference to the angel of the Lord, we know that directly because he says, go back to chapter 9, excuse me, I want to make sure we, we all know this, but again, he says there was a, this, this, the, the light was around, flashed around him in verse 3 of chapter 9 when Paul saw, and he says, um, how, why do you persecute Saul? Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, uh, sir or Lord? And he said to him, well, I think he said it's Lord because it says sir there, but the, the wording should be Lord because Paul knew it was God, he just didn't know who that God was. And so he says, I am Yeshua, whom you persecute. Say what? So that means the Spirit of Christ, again, appeared unto Paul, because that's what he saw is this image. So we know that it's not referencing the Spirit of Christ here. It doesn't say the angel of the Lord, but we know because Christ is literally ascending up to the, he's already ascended to heaven, attending the altar of incense as our high priest. We know that he, the physical person of God, the Son, is attending there, but the Spirit of Christ represents going out unto Paul and appearing to him on Damascus and later on for three years in the, in the desert of Arabia. So he appears first to Joseph, then to Paul, but then we don't realize he also appears to Cornelius and to Peter. Let's check it out. In Cornelius, in chapter 10, verse 3, well, chapter 1 to 3, actually, chapter, chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, and a certain man in, in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of that cohort called the Italian, a pious man and one fearing God with all his house, doing many charities for the people and praying to God always. So here's our people that it's interesting how our Pentecostal friends want to help us understand that he is not a person who is saved or in Christ. Yeah, he is. What's going on in chapter 10 to remind you of our study of the book of Acts. Cornelius is in Christ. He doesn't realize being in Christ. What does that mean to him being a Gentile? Does he partake of the same benefits as the Jews have that believed in Christ? Because he knows there's three different, there's two different types of Jews. There's those that are against Christ and those that are for Christ. 
but he knows one thing is, is, is true, regardless of what side of the fence you're on as a Jew, whether you're for or against Christ, guess what? He's still a Jew. And therefore, by being a Jew, who's the Messiah, who came as the Savior to give us salvation from our sins, Cornelius believed in that, but doesn't understand as a Gentile, where does he fit in? Where does he fit in? He doesn't know. He doesn't understand where he fits in. He comes from a, pol a polyistic, polyistic stone, rock, idiotic worship and mentality of tradition of the Romans and other Gentile folks. He has no clue. And this chapter 10 is about Peter saying to him, because God tells Peter, um, you're, you're one new man now. There's no more Jew Gentile. By the way, it's news to both of you. He doesn't get it and you don't get it, but I'm going to tell you to get it because you're going to have to have that going forward. Okay? Neither one of you have this division anymore. Are we clear on this? The wall of partition is gone, okay? And Peter's like, say, what? I can't even talk to a, a Gentile. I can't even have supped with him. And God's like, I don't want to hear it anymore. Stop calling unclean what I've called clean. And he uses the animals to show Peter that, right? Remember that? And so Cornelius is about the beginning of that story, trying to figure out being in Christ but not being a Jew, where does that leave me? This is the first mentioning of a man who's basically questioning that position in Christ where does that leave me, being a Jew? I mean, being a non-Jew. Excuse me. I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. Who am I to the rest of these? Because at that point, the, the main majority, I would say, dare I say, 90% of Christianity was all Jewish. Cornelius is like, hey, man, I'm, 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 I'm a believer. Where does that leave me? There's a few of us like me. I don't get what happens to us, right? They don't understand what's going on, right? So in reference to this, it says in verse 3, he saw distinctly in a vision... About the ninth hour of the day, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which is interesting because that's when Jesus breathed his last breath. What a coincidence, right? Of course, 3 is God's divine number, and it happens to reference the same time of day that Jesus exited this earth in his physical body, and his soul went to Hades, and his spirit sent it to the Father, and his body went to the grave. It's amazing at that time of the day. And the, look at, watch now. It says, the, of the day, an angel of the God. So, interesting, it says, of the day, the angel, the, an angel of the God. Now, interesting here, it's just not, th this is interesting because you go on and, it sa and he says here, saying to him, Cornelius, and steady gazing at him, he became afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, thy prayers and thine alms went up as memorial before God. So, I personally would say to you here, that when Paul called the appearance Lord, which is what the word Lord or Sir can be translated either way, it's the context, because Paul knew of a, of a true God, then he knew the appearance of, of lightning shining on about was God, he just didn't know, you know what that God is, and so Jesus says, I'm Yeshua whom you persecute. Here, uh, you have a similar fashion where he's gazing at him, which means he was straining uh, and saying, uh, what is it? He's in so much of a fear and reverence so I would tell you this is not some regular angel, which is why they're referencing where it says angel of the God. By the way, notice how the word of the, on the left-hand side of your margin, see where it says angelon of the God? So if you remember, so there's, there's two different thes there. So if you go back, if we go back to page 10 in your diglot, You'll find on, on this, on where it says uh, ton. So see where, where it says on the left side of your, on, on your margin of, of um, page 10 in your diaglot under the singular uh, accusative tense. You see where it says ton, T-U-N, masculine, singular tense? T-O-N, right? So, and if you go back to Acts, again, how does this, how does this uh, phrasing take place? It says... Angel on, angel on, which means the angel, right? That's what it's supposed to mean. The angel of the God. So we see the angel of the God here, but it's kind of veiled because the grammar, once again, doesn't show it to you in the actual separate words. The fact that angel on is in that text, it means the angel. So we've seen that before already. We already saw, but by itself really doesn't mean it's the same thing. But now it's followed by of the God. Oh, <laughs> wait a second. That's different. Right? Just like the angel of the Lord. But here's the question. Remember in the Old Testament, we saw that God also used the phrase 
the angel of Elohim, of God, but they focused on his deity as Elohim. Same, same spirit of, of Christ, but not focusing on his authority, but rather his deity. That's why he uses the phrase Elohim. So why would he use this phrase, the angel of the God here, to Cornelius, instead of the angel of the Lord? It's the only time, by the way, in the New Testament where this phrasing is used. It's not a coincidence, by the way. You know why it's used, if you think about it, and so do I. You know why. Cornelius definitely knew. It was God saying to him, that, and the Spirit of Christ saying to him, I am the God of the Gentiles too. He's like, really? Yes, really. That is crazy. For a Roman to hear that the God of the Israelites, the God who was always anti-Gentile, if you will, because they got the kingdoms were annihilated, destroyed, decimated, people mass killed if you weren't Jewish. Now that same God is going, you're with me. It's hard to believe. Think about that. Cornelius is going, really? He said, yes, really. As a matter of fact, go set for Peter. He'll explain it to you. And Peter has no clue what's going on. God didn't school Peter before he told Cornelius that. He schools Peter after that. Just to show you so much for free will, huh? Peter had no clue. God gave Peter a lesson plan. I mean, God gave Cornelius a lesson plan and told him his teacher was Peter. And Peter had no idea what the syllabus even was. <laughs> you know, God gave him the syllabus after he already gave the tuition <laughs> to, to Cornelius. Here's your signed on class. We're going to have a class on the one new man. We are? Who's going to teach me that? Peter. Peter's like, I'm doing what? Yeah, you're going to go to, but he's a Gentile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just go. Go and do what I tell you to do. Peter's like, okay, I'll do what I must do. So the reality is that the angel of the God is a reference to the same spirit of Christ, the angel of the Lord. But why is emphasizing the God? is because he's emphasizing the deity of he's being the same God, just like he did in the Old Testament. His, he's emphasizing the deity. He's, he's the one deity to the Gentiles too now, not just to the Jewish people. He's not just the monotheistic God of the Jews. He's now the monotheistic God of the Gentiles. And Gentiles were like, that's an amazing thing, right? So that's why he uses it here. But it's interesting to see that this, in fact, happened unto Cornelius. Interesting. But I would therefore say to you that he's the second time we see God revealing himself as the Spirit of Christ unto a person in the New Testament. First, we see Joseph. The purpose of that made common sense to me. He was pronouncing his salvation as a, he was, he was saying, I'm the Savior. But now he's saying, oh, by the way, I'm the unifier. I'm the one who makes the one new man unto Cornelius. But he says it in a different way, too. He changes his title to the angel of the God. Is there any question or comments? Yes. Yeah, we just saw some earlier. We saw earlier in Acts 5, 19, that was an angel. And we're about, we're, we're going to see that that was an angel in Acts, in Acts 5, 19. Remember, we saw that. So in Acts 5, 19, to go back to remind you, that was just a regular angel that by night opened the doors of the prison and bringing them out, said, go and stand and speak in the temple. Well, that was to talking to Peter and John. That's the regular angel, to he your said, point. He said, I missed that. That's all right. That's all right. That's a regular angel there. And no doubt. And also, of course, we have the angels at the resurrection tomb. Regular angels. No doubt about that, right? The angels at the ascension in the book of Acts, chapter 2. The angels that were there at the ascension. Why do you gaze upward, lay this tomb, and they stood by? Those are angels there. Regular, regular guys. And, of course, we saw in Luke 1, you know, by name is Gabriel. Um, but you probably, you probably mean not named. Uh, so not named would be the resurrection angels, the ascension angels. And then the angel uh, in Acts 5 who freed Peter and John from the jail. So you do have references there, to your point. There's another reference in, in the book of Acts later on when the angel appears to Paul, if you recall, on the boat being shipwrecked and saying, I assure you the soul's on board and you will not die. And reminding Paul of his promise beforehand, he'd make it to, to that place in his ministry, which is out ahead, which means he can't die now. So if there's references there to help you that's what you were asking me for the, the, there you go yes and Lenny said did you say Gabriel had a more definitive description and Todd said okay thanks no 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 what I said was no okay, let me, okay. so what I said was that there to I'm not, I mean so I don't want to misspeak here I'm saying that brother Todd was asking me about messages references to an angel in the scripture and so I was saying 
there's references in Scripture to an angel that are not definitive as to what those angels' names are. They're just regular messengers. If they're not named by name, then you have to take it as face value in the context. Who's the angel there? Is it just one of the many angels that is over the, God has dominion over, or is it an angel that God specifies by name? So I'm just saying that Gabriel and Michael, only two we know of by name that God specifies on the good side. On the bad side, of course, we have the anointed cherub that covereth, who becomes Satan in the, in the tribulation period. Yes? And Lady said, okay. And Brad or, said, how do we know when angels deliver messages to us today? <laughs> you don't, remember? In Hebrews it says we are entertained angels unawares. So you don't know. You don't know that. It says we entertain angels unawares. So angels do deliver messages today. Now, God speaks to us in these latter days through his son, right? But he has other moments where angels deliver us messages through people. So I do. that's what's really freaky to me. There's some people that you've met in your life that I think are both ways. You go, what do you mean both ways? I believe you've met people. This is going to sound freaky when you hear me say this, but please don't get all freaked out when I say this. So I'm saying that there's people in your life that you have met that aren't real people, that are angelics, people appearing as men. But there are also people that are real people that are possessed by demons that are also that are buffed at you. And both are true. The angelic people actually don't, they, they, they just manifest as a person that doesn't exist. That person you'll never see again. That person's visage was just a form of that angel's appearance. Whereas a demon will actually possess a real person. And actually, or influence, one of the two, possess or influence, and then be a buffer to you. And I, I, I tell you, I saw this timeline in the Bema Seat. God's going to show us, oh, by the way, remember Sally and Susie and Harry? Those are the ones possessed by demons or influenced by demons. You're like, oh, my gosh. I, I didn't, I, I kind of thought that one. I had no clue about those two. And then over here, he's going to say, look at these slew of angels that came alongside you. That Those weren't real people. They just appeared as people. You're going to be like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That many times? Yep, sure enough. You're like, that's amazing. So, or you're going to see maybe they were there when they didn't even appear in physical form and they helped you uh, through something that you didn't know. They, they're the ones that caused a noise to happen or a sound uh, or, a vision, or, or or you thought you saw something to make you turn a certain way to avoid hardship or a hazard or a danger unto you, stuff like that. So there's going to be angels that are visible and invisible in your life. You're going to learn later on that kept you from out of harm. I believe that hold my heart. Yes, sorry, yes. Ah, it's so funny. You're funny. You're funny. You think it was real. about a line, babe? Who is the other? And Lady said, so the angels recognize angels in the unseen world. Good recognize the bad because they fight right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could tell you, for example, for me, there was definitely an angel involved when I was in my pre, I call it my PJ days before, prior to Jesus. In my PJ days, not pajamas. I was asleep though, right? So I believed in the God of Covenant, but I just didn't believe. In, Repeat I didn't. what you just said. Lainey had a question. In my PJ part. days, prior to Jesus, I was in my days where I, I was driving a, my citation of my dad's citation, mm -hmm. and I was looking down for a cassette tape, and I went like this on the road. And all I heard was, <laughs> and I looked off, and there was a bunch of tree limbs <laughs> coming at me. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I was just, like, freaked out. Like, I couldn't. All around me was green. And the next thing I know, Boom, a big tree in front of me, and I had hit the, hit the windshield. Um, but not full force, I had a seatbelt on, but, you know, just the jerk of that. But then I couldn't get out. The, I was wedged in a ditch. Both doors, there was dirt on the window. Like if I was sitting down, it was eye level, dirt. All, I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I had no idea how I could get out of there. And so I had to pop the hatch, and then and then kind of crawl out the back and, and go that way. That was crazy. And then I saw how I went into the ravine. It was like this, and my car was like this. So how did I not go like that? It was like this, and it went in smooth, like come on. And even the tow truck guy goes, how in the blazes did you go on an edge like that and stay straight? How'd you stay flat? Especially when I was going this way. 
I was doing this, looking for a cassette tape. So therefore, the wheel would have been more so tended to me to flip over, which means I'd have been trapped and I'd have probably died. You're wondering, well, someone would have seen me. No, no, you don't understand. When I stood on the roof of the car, the, the, the street was still above my head. Okay? So I was just in my teenage years. I was fully grown. I was six feet tall, roughly, right? Todd, Todd always says I'm not really six feet. Okay, five, eleven and a half, whatever, right? So I'm right at almost six feet, almost six feet, right? I'm on top of the car. The car is what? Off the ground, what, four or five feet, maybe? It's 12 feet down. I'm t the, the, the road was above my head. So who's, and there's, gra and there's these, and there's this like, there's not really a, uh, there's a little bit of a veer off you could probably see from the road, but not really because all this greenery is in the way. It's like a big, a big like wilderness of greenery. So, I mean, I, I, you couldn't see the roof of the car. You couldn't even see me unless you're looking, I guess, down. You have to really be paying attention. I don't think you really see that. And it wasn't on a major freeway. It was on a side road. Uh, a, a side road on this back country way to get to, to our house as a cut through I did to get to work. So it didn't like it was a major traveled road. It didn't like you're going, you know, to, there's not a, the good line of sight wasn't there to see that. It was on a curve, on a turn. So unless you're really paying attention, you really get God's, you know, God's benefit to you to look over that way, you probably wouldn't have seen me. If I was upside down in there, who knows, I probably would have, you know, who knows what happened to me. The, the guy said I should have died. So I think at that point, the angel, God used an angel, I just left the you know, car to stay straight. Well, God himself did it. I don't know. I just know that it, it's a freaky example of how my life could have been over with and totally different, you know? Yeah. And... Uh like I said, the lady that was texting didn't have an angel uh, last week because she fell six feet and is in the hospital. She is, she was walking and texting. I had a similar experience with a semi truck, she said. And Vicki said, I think God's hand or angels protected me and Dave during our car accident in Georgia in 2012. Pam said, I have a story like that too. And he said, we are evidence that they yeah. were there to protect us. Yeah, we all have that. I, I, one of the stories I'll tell you that's crazy insane is when we were in Texas and, and I was getting tired. So I was driving really fast to get to the hotel late at night. I had to spend the night to go to these uh, places to visit that are like a good three hours from the house. So I have to be there, you know, in the morning and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so I'm hauling butt down this country road because back in Texas it's 70 miles an hour, but I was going like 80. And I was just flying down this country road, this two-lane road, where there's a bunch of farms, uh, uh, type farm, cattle, ranch type people, right? All I remember is I saw cows, cow, 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 cow. I don't know, maybe 20, 30 of them in the road. When I look back, all I, I saw them in the road. All I remember doing was I was like, I went, ah! And I went like this. That's it. And I hit nothing. Impossible. And a Chevy Astro van on a two-lane road covered with cows, I didn't hit one. Yeah, right. And they were and they were a good six feet apart all over the road. I look back and I'm like, no way. No way. And and it's, it's in, and I was going 80. Hitting a cow at that speed, you know, I'm, I'm probably, but that means probably certain death probably because your car's going to be flipped in the air, I'd imagine. I mean, so I'm just saying, there's many things that we can all go through stories, but I would say that there's definitely been angels around your life, my life, to get us to where we are, to protect us from harm's way, no doubt. Yes? Vicki said it does blow your mind. Oh, it, it, it just does. I mean, I, I mean, I don't focus on stories like that as a way to, to, to build my, my faith or to uh, exhibit. I don't even, to, to, my, to that point, how many times have I mentioned that to you guys? Hardly ever. Because it's, it's something I remember, but it's not something I want to hold out there as the reason why I believe in the Lord. That's not why I believe. I believe because of what's in the book. That's why I emphasize the book over the experience. That's why my friends who say, you don't know what it's like to have an experience. Well, I do. I've had experiences that are pretty profound, that are life-changing literally, okay? And so I, I've had them, okay? So don't act like I'm just some doofus that I don't appreciate God's uh, in my life interaction. I just appreciate the Word of God more because those are infrequent. This is frequent, <laughs> okay? This is every day. That's every once in a while. Yes? Lady said, hope they get paid well as they work really hard in my life. <laughs> Pam, it's funny. Pam said, you'd have been visiting all four stomachs. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or even though this fellow wasn't an angel of the Lord, it was somebody I sorely needed in a certain circumstance. I was getting ready to move over here. Well, I'm not, didn't have it yet. I was getting ready to come over here for the all important interview to get the job and with the college. And, uh, car trouble, I 
I didn't know exactly I was having, and one of my students that it was in a class where I taught a bunch of mechanics somehow, I, I can't remember why that happened, but he couldn't come to the final, and he had to come and take it at, at a later night, and I told him about my problem, and I did have some serious car problems. He was a mechanic, we fixed them, and I came here a little, about a day or so later than I was planning to, but I had enough leeway to do that. Oh my heavens, I mean, if that fellow was the one that had to take this final later, and in the interim, I, I, I knew I was having car problems. He happened to be the one that fixed it. That's pretty crazy, right? I probably would have had, you know, I might have just died in the car coming over here if he hadn't fixed it. Yeah, but God, yeah. God has, he's, there's so many things I'm sure we, we remember and things we don't even know about. Don't even remember, we either don't know about or have forgotten about yeah. that God's going, hey, but I did that stuff too. And you're like, I, gosh, I forgot about that. Or I didn't even realize that. I'm sure there's many of those too. There's yeah, many of those. The restraining is this. I, you know, there's one time uh, that uh, I was accused of bad mouthing this former person I shared an office with to this person who was currently sharing the office with. I mean, it, it would have been the truth if I'd said it, but someone else had said that truth to this lady. I, I was tempted to say something to her. I could just feel that restraining. And, and then the division chair had, had me come in his office and he reprimanded me and, and I said, Cheryl, all I've said to her is hi. And I could tell him that truthfully and then the same thing was the truth. Lord kept your tongue. Saying anything to her. So That's pretty kept, cool. And I would never, it would never have occurred to me that others had told her that he had been treated me rather That's shabby. pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty, yeah. Lord kept your tongue in that case, yeah. We got online, babe? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay, and Trey said, hmm, not sure if I want to drive with you or not. And <laughs> <laughs> he said, honey, you are right. Fast thinker, fast driver. And Tracy said, right. And then Lainey said, it just shows how much power angels have and who they see ahead. Okay, so, so, okay, so to clarify, remember that was also a very long time ago, okay? <laughs> so I don't drive like that uh, All anymore. The time. Well, I drive sometimes. I'd say I'm a. I say I'm, I'm a very, uh, you know, I'm a very swift or quick driver, but I don't speed like that, uh, and I don't drive as reckless as nowhere near I used to, no, but nowhere near. People could say there's moments, maybe, but at best, but there's not a constant, there was a constant back then, just to be straight about that. Yes, yes. Lainey said we all do. Yeah, but I, was, I was being honest about it. Yeah, I do drive. I have moments, don't get me wrong, but not like it was back then. It was like all the time. There was a long distance travel time. Mm -hmm. Well, I was all over that. I was totally reckless. Yes. Vicki said, can the Lord change your direction by changing your mind to avoid doing something? <laughs> and Lainey said, good question, Vicki. Yeah, I, I, yes. So, okay, so here, here's the answer to that question. It, it's yes, but then also no. So God's will before time has already been orchestrated. So in time, he can change your perception of something that's been ordained before time. And so to you and me, we will have the ability to believe and think and experience that has been a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of attitude, when in fact it was already ordained before time because he changed our perception of the same truth that's always been there, of the same spiritual, physical uh, reality has now been altered in how we perceive it, how we interact with it, and so therefore we do something differently than we believe we would have done earlier because now our mind's been changed. So when, when God changes our minds, He's changing our vantage point of the same truth. He's changing our paradigm of the same truth. The truth didn't change. How he, how he led us to see it changed. <laughs> he gave us the belief that we had something to do with that or in fact that he moved it when actually he didn't. He just moved, he just moved our thoughts and how we see it. Yes. Vicki said, so when Dave and I decided not to go skiing at Vail the year, the day the tram fell, that was preordained. Absolutely. So God moved your thoughts to think that way, but the tram was going to fall either way. You weren't going to go either way. But because he moved your thoughts to think about that, you see it differently as if you had something to do with that decision when it actually was God all along. But he moved your thoughts to think that. So in time, there was a collaboratory aspect of how we experience God's will. When he changes our minds, it's collaboratory. He gives us the privilege of tapping into his will that's already been ordained to give us this sense of, wow, we were a part of that thought that he already had. We didn't, we didn't create the thought. It was his thought. He just put it in our mind at that time 
let us be touched by him to say, oh, by the way, I'm including you, giving you a heads up that I'm going to save you from hardship. You're like, what are you talking about? Until after it happens, you're like, oh, my gosh, now I know why <laughs> we didn't go. So that, that's what that is. Yes. And uh, Lainey said, what was that, Vicki? I always think about that when I change my trips on the plane. Vicki said, long ago, before 1975. Pretty cool, man. Maybe 1976. It's pretty cool. That's why, interesting enough, whenever I have, whenever we leave town for a long trip vacation, I always pay all the bills I possibly can for that month um, that I'm aware of I don't forget about. Because I'm always thinking, what if I'm, you know, drop dead Fred on the way there? I don't get back. <laughs> so I want the people to be paid. I always do that because I don't know, you know. Anyway, that's the, that's kind of sounds morbid. But all right, so now we go to, um, going back to, so we saw Acts 10.3. That was Cornelius in Acts 10.22. Uh, <clears throat> we we see again. Lainey said, I always empty all my trash cans before I leave. Huh? <laughs> we see again that you're fun. Yeah. So in Acts 10, 22, back to Cornelius and the angel of God appearing to him, because of the name difference here, it's, he's emphasizing the deity of Christ as the same God over the Gentiles as well as the Jews. As Now he's their monotheistic deity. So here in verse 22, he continues on this referencing with Cornelius, and he said, And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous man, and one fearing God, and esteemed by all the um, nation of the Jews, and he says, was divinely instructed by a holy angel, um, or I should say of <laughs> the ethnos of the Jews, because remember there's Jews that were also proselytes, that's why the ethnos of the Jews is there, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to send after thee to his house and to fear words from thee. Um, so again, you have this referencing to this angel. He appeared to him as now being described as a holy angel, an agios angel. Well, not to say that all angels aren't, right? <laughs> So why emphasize that to this angel? So you see a different um, description being given to try to add light to what he said before, that it was the angel of the God. So now we find that he calls this angel a holy angel, which is interesting. It's almost like it's repetitive. Of course all angels are holy. Why do you have to say that? And I would therefore dictate that it's declaring the deity of Christ. So then you ask, so Acts chapter 12, where you see the angel of the Lord appear to Peter. This is interesting. Yes? Vicki said, versus a fallen angel. Yeah, versus a fallen angel. They're not good. They're bad people. Unholy, right? <laughs> That's correct. So, in Acts 12, verse 7, now we see the, the, the referencing again that we saw over in Matthew, where the, the Adu is there again, where it says, Lo, behold. You'll see the phrase in verse 7 of Acts 12, when Peter's in the jail. And lo, behold, or Adu, there is, uh, there is the, right? Uh, that's the, because the word the is in that word, how the grammar suffix is ending with ooh. So that means, and lo, behold, the angel of the Lord, of the Lord. This is directly the same phrasing used with Joseph. Wow, yowza. Now it's used exactly the same way. Interesting. So only in the, in, in the book of Matthew unto Joseph, and in the book of Acts chapter 12 unto Peter is the same exact phrase used, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the God is used to Cornelius, and it's not used, but it's inferred unto Paul because we know that Jesus, Yeshua, talked to him in the spirit of Christ. But directly imputed, it was to Joseph and Peter. And why is that? Because Joseph was the first parent of, of the Lord in, his, in the household to grow and rear him up. He was the beginning of the authority. He was the, he was the voice and face of authority unto the parental role of raising up the Son of God. God the Son, and then Peter was the voice, the voice and face, post-resurrection. So one was pre-birth, and one was uh, post-resurrection of the voice and face of Christianity in Peter. And he says, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a bright light, or excuse me, a light shone round, say brightly, a light shone round, and the building, and striking Peter on the side, he awoke him, saying, arise quickly, and his chains fell from his hands. And it says, and the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals, and he did so, and he says to him, Throw thy mantle around you and follow me. Now, it's interesting how in verse 9, and going out he followed him and knew not that it was that what was done by the angel was real, but he thought it was a vision. Now, I would say to you the reason why I thought it was a vision, because God, the angel of the God appeared to Cornelius in a vision, a vision, excuse me, appeared to Joseph in a dream twice, appears to Cornelius in a vision, Peter in a vision, and then Paul also in, in more so in, in, I said more real life there, right? But you have a reality here that when Peter was doing everything this angel said, 
he, he, went, he went to and from. And then you go back to um, in verse 10, and having passed through the first, second guard, he came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them itself. And going out, they went forward one street, and immediately the angel withdrew from him. And Peter became self-possessed, saying, I know that I truly, now I know truly that the Lord sent his angel. See, now it says on the left side of your margin, and it says, now he sent the angel of himself. The angel of himself. From, and delivered me from the hand of Herod and all the expectation of Jewish people. So what's interesting is, he says, the angel of himself. Now, he's telling you that it could be interpreted two ways. That it's the Lord's angel, right? As he says in Revelation 22, 6. But that's not the Lord saying that's his angel. This is Peter saying the angel of himself, which can be, which can be interpreted one of two ways. Either that's the Lord's personal angel, or that's the Lord himself as an angel, in an angelic form, in the Spirit of Christ. I think it's the latter. Because Peter is the one commenting on what he experienced, not so much Christ in Revelation 22, 16, when we saw him say, the angel of, of himself, of me, when he says that about himself, that's different. Then it's clearly his angel. But when Peter is recalling what he experienced, I believe he's talking about that a avenue of, of thought, that he's talking about this angel, uh, again, being the angel of God, uh, the angel of the Lord that he knew that, he, that he's heard about from the Old Testament, and therefore this is the Spirit of Christ. So that's Acts 12, 7. And then also you got that in verse 11. And also in verse 23, um, interesting enough, when it says here uh, in verse 23, you can see where it says, uh, to Brother Todd's point, where is, there, where is there a case where there's just an angel? Here's an angel right here, Brother Todd. This is not the angel of the Lord. This is just angelos, see? An angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord struck down Herod. Not the angel of the Lord, but just an angel. Struck him down. So you have their reference to, a re you mentioned before, so you have angels in the, the resurrection, you have angels in the regular jail cell in Acts 5, you have angels at the ascension, you have an angel here um, also striking down Herod. You're going to find one later on in the book of Acts appearing with Paul on the ship. Yes? <coughs> Todd said, what about in verse 15, Peter saw an angel? Yeah, so, yep, so Peter, um, so here goes verse, verse 15. So, and ver that's going back to, um, and there was knocking at the door, verse 13, at the gate, and the female servant Rhoda came to visit, to listen, excuse me, look for the context here. Having recognized Peter's voice, he opened not the gate from joy, but running in, told them that Peter was standing at the gate, and they said to her, you are mad, but she strongly asserted that it was so, and they said, it is his angel. So, that's referring to the personal angel that Peter has because they're referring to the fact, how can Peter, Rhoda, be at your door when he's in jail? Right? They don't know that the angel of the Lord got him out of jail and freed him. They have no clue. So when she's saying she sees him outside, they're saying, no, that's his angel talking on his behalf to you, which speaks to two things. One, that we have our own angels assigned to us for those who are Inherit, looking to enter and inherit the, the heavens, specifically called out ones, the church, if you will. Not everybody who believes in Christ, but just the church. Whereas, why would she therefore, why would they for that? Why would they for, she say it's Peter, but then they took her comment as if to say, well, that's his angel. How could they think she could mistake a human for an angel unless the angel was in a human form? And being at night, they thought that maybe she was not able to understand the difference and the angel was speaking on his behalf sounding like him because he knew the things that only Peter would have gone through and so therefore they're thinking maybe she thought that was a Peter but actually it's an angel so therefore the angel has an intimate knowledge of sounds like looks like Peter some of those things have to be true for them to have said you must be mistaking Peter for the angel or else why would they say that he has to sound like look like or know about things that feeling Peter would know look and sound like for them to impute to her, you're mistaking the angel for Peter. But in fact, they said one thing clearly, that it's his angel, which means he has an angel assigned to him. But that has nothing to do with the angel of the Lord. That has to do with Peter and having his own personal assigned angel. And this is after the leading out of the jail. This is different. This is him knocking at the door at this point, and that's when that happens. So that answers your question, I hope. No. What's that? Yeah. Is it, no, there we go. And he said yes. 
All right, good, good question. So then you go, because again, there's another angel there in, a, in Acts 12, 23, with, who kills Herod. Then you go over to, um, so here you have a special, you have, a, you have right here, definitely, and then here, definitely. Then you got then another angel, just a regular angel, in Acts 27, 23, going back to what you mentioned before, Brother Todd. Uh, just show me a regular angel, right? Here's one. Um, and, and Paul's ship, shipwreck, well, not, not shipwreck yet, but about to be. Uh, in verse 23, and middle of this big storm, and Paul's going through, and verse 23 of Acts 27, for there stood by him this night an angel. And it's an angel of the God. Not the angel, like as, as according to what we saw over in Cornelius' case, but this is an angel of the God. So here you have an angel stood by him and who's, who's God, who I, who's I am and whom I serve, saying, fear not, Paul, and goes on. So there's a regular, again, context for an angel. So, so here we have um, these, this verse here. <clears throat> Those are not referencing um, actual um, the angel of, of the Lord. The ones circled do, but not the other ones I crossed out. So again, uh, we see that that's it right there for the New Testament. <clears throat> so to reprise this, to go back and revisit as we're ending our, our time today, remember on Theophanes and Christophanes, we saw God appear as the angel of the Lord six times before in the Old Testament. He appeared unto Balaam with a sword, Joshua with a sword. Then he appears with Gideon. Not with a sword per se, but he does lay down the law and takes out justice, right? So we see with Balaam, Joshua, Gideon, the angel of the Lord appears as, guess what? A defender. He's the defender. Six times the Lord appears in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. And he's a defender first. But the next thing he does, the other three times, he's the provider. He appears to David at the threshing floor. He's providing a way in which to build the temple. He appears unto, uh, where am I at here? I missed my space. Oh, first before that, Samson's, Samson's mom and dad to give them a person who could stand before the Philistines as his man before there was the times of the kings, the time of the judges. So he was going to he'd be the provider. He provided a, a voice for him, a strength for Israel. He provided to Samson's parents that he was going to be there to, to, to lead his people. Invited to David, he would help build a temple through his son Solomon, and invited to Elijah that he would have food and water and then go back and realize that there would be someone after him he would train up in Elisha. So there is actually, God appears the first three times to show himself as a defender, the next three times to show himself as the provider of his people. Interesting, I find. Three divided by three. Three times he's a defender, and three times when he appears, he's the provider. But then the New Testament is different. He appears four times, but he has three different messages. Unto Joseph, he's the Savior. Yeah, no doubt, right? No doubt, he's the Savior. Unto Cornelius, he's the unifier. He's, he's, he's the one who forges the one new man in Christ. What no man can do, he does. I think it's interesting that we saw recently a person on, uh, on our family say, look at my little uh, two-month-old. I'm just so proud of this little baby I created. Say, well, no, you didn't. No, God created. It's so interesting how you can get mistaken in those verbiages. Don't ever say that. As a woman, I'm not a woman, obviously, but as a woman who gives birth, I know you're proud, and I know you're loving, and I know you're endearing unto your child, but don't ever say, I created, because no, you did not. Do not say that. It is a total fallacy of, of verbiage. Don't say it. And those who do, please correct them lovingly and let them know it's God's creation in you. Okay, it is not, you didn't create anything. God used your manufacturing of a factory of life from which to forge life. He provided the materials and he provided the assembly and your factory. Okay, let's get that straight. It's his widget, and it's his factory worker. He's the factory worker and his widget. You were, the, you were the warehouse in which he put all the pieces together. You did not create anything. Get that real, okay? Yes. Tracy said, bye all, love you, have a good week, have a baby shower. Oh, okay. Well, oh, thinking of baby, look at that. <laughs> okay, so, okay, I love you too. All right, so then we have God also into Peter and Paul. He appeared as a, as a deliverer because he delivered Peter from jail cell 
and he delivered Paul from his life of persecution uh, as the Pharisee of Pharisees on the Jewish people and his life of murderous killing for two years. So he delivered both of them from their, from their situation, one Peter from um, being about the near death, and then from Herod, Peter even says so, and then from Paul, a life of just shamelessness. So, in ignorance, right? So, he's a defender and provider in the Old Testament when he appears as the angel of the Lord. And he's the savior, he's the unifier, and he's a deliverer when he appears that way in the New Testament. I think it's just interesting to me how he chooses to emphasize that reality of who he is in those occurrences when he appears. So, also look back on the other side of the board over here. I mentioned the Lord has this, we haven't looked at this yet. The Lord has this personal angel. All right. So in these passages here, you're gonna to, to have to look there, but these are passages where, where the people use the uh, angel of God reference to speak of a king or of a man. Say you're as like an angel of God. So it shows you that you can see that messaging come across that the word angelos is used to represent not just an angel or the angel, but also how man can portray or can can be embodying the will of God in, in their life. And so people go, wow. Yes? And Vicki said, who are the three defender people? I'm sorry. God presents himself as a defender to Balaam, Joshua, and Gideon. And then he presents himself as a provider to Samson's parents, King David, and the prophet Elijah. Okay? And you said thanks. You got it. So then, then on the left side of your margin over here, we didn't look at this. I, I put the Lord has this personal angel, and we put some um, things in it, but I crossed off the ones that were not accurate. But we're going to see the other ones. This is where we're going to end for our, our message. So go to Genesis 24 7. Genesis 24 7. You'll see some interesting comments here about the Lord saying his angel, that he has a personal angel. Going back to what Jesus said, Yeshua said in in Revelation 22, 16. So again, Genesis 24, 7. Now watch this now. The Lord God, Genesis 24, 7, the Lord God, Chaveh Elohim of the heavens, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which is Abraham talking, Abraham talking, right? And which he spoke unto me, and, and that swear unto me, saying, unto thy seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before you, and shall take care and shall take a wife unto my son from thence. Send his angel? What do you mean? It's a reference to a personal angel. Interesting. Look at verse 40, Genesis 27. And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son. So twice he tells Eleazar that the Lord has a distinct angel of him. So I would say to you that, interesting enough, that the Lord in the Old Testament, Kaveh, is known as God the Father. Adonai is known as God the Son because of King David's comment in Psalm 110.1, the Kaveh said to my Adonai, sit at thy throne and put your, put your enemies under a footstool. Well, if that's the case, well then therefore Kaveh in this context of the Old Testament, even though we know that is the embodiment of the authority that was given over to the Son of the New, which then he takes on the name Chaveh as well. But in the Old Testament, Chaveh was distinctly put God the Father. And if that's the case, then therefore God the Father and God the Son have their own personal angel. Interesting, is it not? Now, which one was God the Father in 7 or 40? Both of them are God the Father. So in the Old Testament, you see Chaveh, or El so Chaveh, the Lord, is a reference to the authoritative nature of God in the Old Testament. So when, he, when Jesus, God the Son, that's why he's called the angel of the Chave. He's not, he's not Chave, the angel. He's the angel of Chave because he's God the Son. Who's, he's, he's under the authority of God the Father until he comes in the New Testament, and then he's given all authority at that point. Now he is also using the name Chave, or the Lord, whereas when he was in ministry, they called him Adonai. Uh, that's what he is. He's Adonai. He's the other, as J David said, the Chave said to my Adonai. They're both Lord, but he's a different God the Son. When all authority gets to him, then he embodies that name as well. Yes? Uh, Vicky said, aren't the cherubim pro protectors of the throne? So maybe they are God angels? Okay, a couple things. Don't, don't forget. Don't forget the angelology page in your, in your book. 
So you have seraphim, seraphim around the throne singing praises. You have the four living ones, and you have 24 elders. And all those, they don't move that we know about from the throne room. They're pretty much, the seraphim are right there closest to the throne itself, and the others are in the throne room. But they're right next to the throne is the seraphim, and the throne room are the four living ones and the 24 elders. They don't move from their station that we know of. However, the other angelic hosts do move and traverse, with the exception of the cherubim, which are the underneath the mobile Jerusalem, the mobile heavenly throne. They move and support the throne with their wings and eyes and the, and the gyroscope and so forth. But there's the one cherubim that goes from underneath and to above over the altar of fire. He brings the incense up to the altar of fire. He represents that high priestal ministry as the one priest would go in once a year and, and do that. Yes? That's another thing. Yeah, you got the, in the mouth of two witnesses, you got the two witnesses that Rebecca was the wife. I mean, sorry, but yeah, yeah Rebecca was the wife for Isaac. Yeah. Uh, and for all, that's the, pretty good, yeah. for all yeah, the mistakes she made. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, well, that's true. That you, well, give her latitude. She's a sinner. But, <laughs> but, well, I'm but, saying, I mean, but the, the, she was God's choice. And of course, David made his mistakes. He was God's I mean, being, being premature. Well, when you say, well, Rebecca, the only thing that, or Rachel's the one who had the idols. Had, Rebecca is the only mistake that she had, basically, what people would claim that she didn't, she told Jacob to lie. But then again, in her mind, she's, she's basically coalescing, she's coalescing to the will of God that was told to her that the older would serve the younger. So she's just thinking that this has been ordained then for her to, you know, coalesce to that will. Because well, it's, too, yeah, she was mama's boy, no doubt about it. <laughs> that was mama's boy, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, yeah, he's a man's man, and he was mama's boy, so he's a softy. And then Esau was like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a big muscular man. Well, and yeah. that's why he, he took, a, I guess, a heathen bride, Esau. Well, that was in rebellion, though. To his, to his defense, that was in rebellion. He, it says in the scripture he wanted to, and, and paraphrase, get back at his folks for you know slighting him. So he took an Ishmaelite bride and a Midianite bride. He took both because he wanted to just say, hey, man, you don't want to you know, embrace yourself to me, then fine. Then I'll endear myself to others. I mean, it's just, it's like anybody else in this world. I think to me, Esau is the award picture of the early consequence of a parent who raises their child with unfortunate lack of guidance by God, uh, loving in the right kind of what we call love. Love has parameters to it. It's not just some lovey, gushy feeling. There has to be parameters of truth and understanding of God, not just some lovey, gushy feeling. I hate people to say that to me. Love's not a gushy feeling. It's a, it's, a, it's a choice of obedience unto God. So if you don't teach your kids the right way and love them the way God says to, which is with truth and with conviction, having tough conversations sometimes, then therefore, and they will at times, not every time, but oftentimes, they will rebel and marry somebody that is anti-God, that is anti-spiritual for their life as just a way of rebellion against you, the parent. And you, whoa, look at yourself. It's, so it's like, it, that's not a good commentary. So it, it speaks to them primarily, but secondarily, the parents got to say, what did I not do to let him know that he should have done better than that, that he was loved? Because apparently he, didn't, he felt slighted. He did. Esau felt slighted by, by Jacob and, and, and by, Isaac, by Isaac and Rebekah. He felt slighted because he said he did what he did to, in essence, you know, give back at him. Well, of course, both he and Cain were the first. No, I know. It's true. I know. I know. Yes. Ricky said, okay, so maybe the seraphim are, so the seraphim don't protect. They just sing praises. Never mind. And then Lainey said, honor thy father and thy mother would be hard there for Esau. Yeah, I no. understand the situation, but his pride and rebellion got him. Yeah, I mean, he's primarily responsible, but I, as a secondary understanding there of, Isaac and Rebecca, and I'm not going to point fingers, I'm just saying there's a lot of family dynamics there. The best book to read in the entire Bible for family dynamics and social uh, prim premises of how to live the right way is Genesis. There's no other better book you could ever read that goes through family dynamics than Genesis. There's no better, fa there's no, I don't care if you're from an adoptive family, step, natural born, divorce, marriage, older, younger, in between, it don't matter none. It covers it all if you look closely. Every family dynamic you're ever going to come across and wonder, what am I doing in this situation? There are so many stories and principles to draw from in Genesis, it isn't funny. And that's the reason why it isn't just the first book written, or I should say in the, in the book, 
Job was written first, but the first book that was put in the beginning, it was not just the beginning of things in God's restoration, but it's the beginning of things of how we can be restored in our families, which I think is ironic. Think about that. Of all the things for God to focus on in the beginning of, of his first book that he told Moses to write, he focused a lot on family dynamics, more than any other subject matter. I, I'm telling it's truth. You can read it yourself. Don't believe me. Read the book. Is there, there's, all, there's so many families mentioned in, in, in dynamics and stories in that book that's the most, I would say, of, of family stories. There's no other more, more quoted book than that one because there's no other family story. There's stories about Israel through Numbers and Exodus, absolutely, but as a people, as a family unit, there's not many stories outside of Genesis that you find that are that, that, are that rich and deep. Genesis is late, loaded with them, just loaded with all those stories. Yes? You, well, for, remember now, in Abraham's account in Genesis 15, he thought Eliezer was the promised seed, and God said no, and that's when he first appeared to him and said no, you can't. That's when he so you used that whole phrase of the stars of the heavens and referring to how Abraham loved Eliezer so much. So Eliezer, I would not say felt slighted, just the opposite. He felt very um, lovingly endeared by his father Abraham because adopting him from Egypt and loving him so much that he would impute to him as the promised seed, how could you not feel good about that? And then have God himself be the only one who said to Abraham, not, not Sarah, his wife, not Hagar, just God himself said, no, he's not the one. So as far as everyone else was concerned, Abraham was right. There was no anti-testimony to his belief that Eliezer was an upstanding, morally sound, obedient son. So if there was, there would have been some naysaying by Sarah or Hagar, Hagar but there wasn't. So which speaks to Eliezer's belief and his, and his understanding that he was very well endeared and loved by, by Abraham. So I believe also, unlike the, the, the faithful son and the prodigal son story, where he gets upset and says, I'm with you for so long, I think Eleazar is the opposite of that. You saw none of that uh, sense of uh, being slighted or not being loved. There's no mention of it, because I believe he was a faithful, dutiful son, even despite the fact that he realized that God's will was to take Isaac, the promised seed, and pronounce him as the guy, and then later on to take a wife for him. I felt Eleazar had no problem take, taking second fiddle because he realized that it's, it's, it's sure enough, he's like the wife of God the Father. Compared to the bride of Christ, he'll never be. But you know what? They are so happy to be in the same venue or the same place as, as Abraham, as in, their, in this case, as their father. How would they not be? You're not going to be pickers and choosers when you realize you're fortunate just to be at that place. You don't even deserve that. You were adopted for crying out loud. So it's different. So he's a different faithful son. Very dutiful, not argumentative, not anywhere near a bad, you know, state of, you know, what do you want to call it, antagonistic, nothing like that. Yes? Okay, and um, she has, Lainey has said, what is Eliezer and type for us since he was adopted into Abraham's family? I know the promised seed from Abraham's loins, but Eliezer is a big part. And then she said, okay. Yeah, Eliezer is type in the spiritual realm of the Holy Spirit who, who, who who works on behalf of the Father. He's also a type in, in, in future prophetic sense of the wife of God, who takes their role as second with, without, without hesitation, without grumblings. And he's also a type of, of us in every facet of where you are to be content with who you are in Christ. Don't argue, don't bicker, don't murmur, don't get upset. Be content like him and where you are in Christ because he never had one thing recorded about him being upset that he was slighted for, I, for Isaac. Not one thing that's said about him just the opposite. Again, the father, without him going into a descriptive nature, like God did with Job, it was pretty much inferred that Abraham thought the world of Eleazar. Everything that he was going to give to him. Everything. And, not, and to show you later on, even though Isaac's the promised one, who does he choose to be the one he entrusts all of his goods to to go pick out his, his wife's son? Eleazar. I mean, you can't, if you're going to be sick and fiddle, there's no better place to be when it comes to of all the men on the earth, you want to be second fiddle to Abraham. Of all the men lived in that time, there's nobody you want to be second fiddle to than him. I mean, I don't care if I'm, Isaac's ahead of me. If I'm in the same house as that guy, I'm in good state. I'm in a good place because God's blessing him like nobody's business. And if I'm second to that, then I'm just content and happy as a, as a pig in mud. Well, that's why <laughs> the, the type of Holy, the Holy Spirit in the world drawing the bride of Christ. Right. That's right. Yeah, Eleazar is a type of the Holy Spirit. And in and, and real time, he's a type of the wife of God future time. 
but he's an example to us in principle to be content with who we are and accept it with joy and not disgruntledness and antagonistic. Be, be content. Yes? Uh, first of all, Vicki said type of Gentiles being adopted in. Oh, yeah. Sam said we are adopted in Christ. Uh, Gentiles are grafted in yep. uh, to the olive tree. Yep. Um, and Lainey said Abraham loved so many and even probably knew Lot was making a bad decision but let him go ahead. Yep. Yeah, Abraham's also, he's a type of, uh, it's, he's a different old type altogether. He's a wonderful man, I think. I wish he was my dad. So, but can't do that, right? So, all right, so also going back to Genesis 48. Look at Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. 48, verses 15. So, by the way, Vicki, your, your statement in question. So, I don't think that God, God the Father's angel is a seraphim or a four-living one or, an el or a 24 elder. I believe God the Father has an angelos, a regular angelos, as there's a chief angelos that answers to him, and there's a chief angelos that answers to God the Son. So there's the seraphim, the, the four living ones, the 24 elders, and the cherubim, and they're all on the, they're exempt. And then outside of those guys who have chief roles, the angelos, the infantry people that go out and do all the bidding of God that go to and fro, there's two of them that are singled out, one by God the Son to do his bidding, and one by God the Father to do his bidding. That's what I'm saying. And, and that is profound to me. <laughs> so there's almost like, because remember, Michael and Gabriel are those two guys by name mentioned. Michael's called an archangel. Gabriel's not called that, but you see him a lot pronouncing God's good news to people. So people say he's the one who blows the trumpet, for example. We don't know that. doesn't say that, and they're, and they're real rapture. People infer that, you know. So who are the angels blowing the trumpets, you know, for example? Those are not regular angels. There's, so you think about that. People say, well, what do you mean there's an angel above all the other angels that answers to God the Father? Well, are there not seven angels distinctly who have the trumpets and distinctly have the bowls and vile judgments? Sure. And distinctly open up the woes in Revelation? Sure they do. Sure they do. There's different angels. And we saw already that Jesus even said he has his own angel. And God the Father says he has his own angel. So therefore, they both have an angel that's among the angelos, the regular minions, that answer directly to them individually. Now, I don't know why that is, but I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, yes. Vicki said, these two personal angels don't protect. They um, are messengers only. Yeah, they don't, they, there's no, correct. I don't think they, they're more, they're more of God's, um, his right arm of, he used, that, that's like his go-to uh, messenger he uses. When he's delivering a message, he, he, they use, God the Son uses his go-to, and God the Father uses his go-to angel. They both know, like, they're his chief what do you call it, like a cupbearer of the king back in the day? You know, the butler of the king. They're like his chief butler. Think of it that way. They're his chief butler to go and do his bidding. They're the guy. There's many service men and women in, in the house of a king, right? There's many people of service unto God in the angelic host. But there's one butler, if you will, chief cupbearer of the king of kings on God the son's side and the king of kings on God the father's side. Yes? She said, okay. Yeah, so... I want to make sure we answer that. So in, in Genesis 48, verse 15 and 16, he says, And he blessed Joseph and said, Elohim, before whom my fathers and Isaac did walk, for Elohim which fed me, tended me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be the name of them, and let the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now notice how he says here, the angel. So this is not an angel of God personally. This is God saying that he's being referred to as the angel, as in the angel of the Lord. Interesting enough. So interesting that he's got that reference there. So then you go to Exodus. Exodus 33. And Exodus 33 and verse 1 and 2. And Chave, the Lord, said unto Moshe, Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed, unto thy seed I will give it. And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. He will send an angel before them. Why would he send, you know, an angel there? What's is that his personal angel? We don't know, but he just says send an angel. There's no reference to, to concretely there that it's his angel, but it's a, it could be. And then you go over to Isaiah 63:9. Isaiah 63:9. 9. 
Go to Isaiah 63, 9. And Lainey said, uh, New King James says, my angel. Yep. That's why, because in the Hebrew text, it has that referencing of an angel that's, that's unique to him. Whereas the angels that rescued Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, those are two angels that went there. They're not distinctly mentioned as his, like from God directly. There's like a different direct association there. So Isaiah 63, 9, he says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved him, saved them, and his love and his pity redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. The angel of his presence. Wow. Good gracious. The angel of his presence. So is that speaking to the angel of the Lord, or is that speaking to God's personal angel? God the Father, that is. So I think it's interesting how um, it could be either one because we only we know that when he says the angel of the Lord saved them, we have three references to where he was the defender in the case of Balaam, Joshua, and Gideon. But we also know that Michael the archangel and other things happened in areas beyond that because if it ends with Gideon, you have many more times where God delivered them from the, from the Assyrians, Babylonians, you know, Medes and Persians, Greeks, Romans, right? So it, it's more than just that, but you only have that reference. So I think that Isaiah 63, 9 refers to either one. Is, I'm fine with the interpretation. It could be the angel of the Lord, or it could be God's personal angel on God the Father's side. Yes? Uh, Pam said reference by to verse 32, 35. Back to what she said. Oh, we're going back to, um, we're going back to Exodus she's talking about. I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but that's okay. So, so if you go to Daniel 6.22, go there. Let me show you there. Because we're running close, short of the... And Daniel 6.22, or 6.21 actually, to the context. Then Daniel, in the lines then, unto the king, O king, live forever. My God, Elah, has sent his angel... Daniel 6, 22, and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me and as before thee, O king, I have done no wickedness. See, God, Daniel says God sent his angel. <laughs> oh, interesting. But in 328, I crossed, those are mentionings of, but they're not attributed to that phrasing because here we found that's the angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord. That's God, one of the, you know, so that's also, okay? So then we have the New Testament to remind you. Pam uh, said 33.2 references 32.4, my angel. And then she said, never mind. Oh, I got you. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then Todd said Exodus. So you said, say it again, 33. What say it again, babe? 32.34. Yeah. So 33.2 references 32.34. Oh, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Yep. Yep, I got you. Thank you. You're right. So in verse 32, in verse 34, the previous chapter of Exodus, he says, And therefore go lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Thank you. And then over in verse uh, 2 of chapter 33, he says, I'll send an angel before you. So that is referencing that angel. That I got you now. Thank you. My apology. You're spot on. Yep. And Todd said, please... Uh So my angel, so that's God the Father. That's God the Father saying that he has a personal angel amongst the an angelos. So think of a military order of things. Because remember, God has a rank and file that he, he sees us as. There's a rank and file also among the host of the angelic beings he's created. So they have the seraphim next to the throne. You have the four living ones surrounding the throne. You have 24 elders also in the throne room. Then you have cherubim underneath right, the throne, and one goes to and fro, the altar of incense, typifying the high priest ministry. Then you have the angelos, who are the total myriads and myriads of minions all around God's creation. He just, so of those who do God's bidding to go to and from the throne room, 
Those are the Angelos. And of the Angelos, God the Father has a specific one that he calls upon constantly to kind of take the message to, to either the rest of the folks of the Angelos or to man himself. And God the Son is the same way. But nonetheless, they have their own chief, their own butler, if you will, their own chief butler angel that answers to them. They have their own go-to, if you will. So God the Son has an angel that is his, that he go, always, go, always calls on the same one to, to initiate the bidding of the rest of the angelos the, or unto man, and God the Father the same way. All right, They both have their own. That's what I'm saying by mine angel. So there's an angelos that answers to God directly. So when you, when, now many would say that it's Michael the archangel. I'm not saying I say that. Many would say it's Michael the archangel on God the Father's side. And many say it's Gabriel on God the Son's side because those are the two associated with names in the Bible. And therefore they say Michael because of his uh, strength to um, you know, fight for Israel. That's why you see him on God the Father's side. And they say Gabriel because he announced the birth of Christ to Mary that he's on God the Son's side. That could be. That could be. I don't know that for a fact, though. I have no problem with hearing that. I just don't want to say that that's concretely the belief system, but I don't have any problem with that being true because if it is true, it wouldn't surprise me that Michael the Archangel is the chief angel on God the Father's side and Gabriel is the chief angel on God the Son's side. Maybe so. Yes? Now you wonder, does that mean Lucifer is originally from God the Holy Spirit? He's the only other named angel we know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. But here's the thing. He's not called Lucifer until he falls. He's called the only chair that covereth. He's called Lucifer when he's cast out of heaven unto the earth in the Antichrist and the beast. That's what Jesus says. He saw him from heaven falling down as lightning. And that's back in Job when he calls him Lucifer as ascending down. And he comes down. He didn't down. have a name until no. he falls. Correct. He has, he has no cherub that covers.